Okay, welcome back. Now, last hour we found that you put yourself into financial bondage when you choose to allow the material things of this world to come between you and God. Remember, that was financial bondage. Last time we, we ended up talking about financial bondage, this hour we want to start out by talking about financial freedom. We're going to consider God's plan, uh, what His path looks like, and then we're going to be talking about a specific um, plan of action, a written plan of action that you are going to be able to use to get yourself ready to begin to walk down God's path of financial freedom, okay? And then, of course, we'll, take, we'll continue to take a look at Rex, our Roman soldier friend here, okay? All right. So that's where we're going. Let's go ahead and get started. First of all, financial freedom. What is it? What is it? Now, I don't know if there are any English teachers here or not. Any English teachers here? No English teachers? That's a good thing. Yeah, that, because, you see, I used to have a hard time in English trying to define something by what it was. Sometimes with me, it was a whole lot easier to try and define something by better understanding what it wasn't before I moved into what it was, okay? And it's the same thing with, with financial bondage. You know, the very first thing about financial freedom is that it doesn't include financial bondage. I understand what financial bondage is because I see it working in my life all too often sometimes. But when it gets time to think about financial freedom, my first transition is, well, it doesn't include all the stuff that I'm used to seeing in financial bondage. It, it doesn't include the greed, the, the fear, the worry, the aggravation, the irritation, the covetousness, the get-rich-quick attitude, and, and all of those things. See, what it, what it does, what financial freedom literally means is a release from financial bondage. Philippians 4, 6, we're told this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now notice here, you are told by God not to fret and not to worry, not to have anxiety about anything. Now this means if you do fret, if you do worry, then my friends, you're disobeying and you're out of God's will in this area. And financial freedom comes from being in the will of God, not out of it. So the very first thing that we find out about financial freedom is that it doesn't include all the junk that goes along with financial bondage, all right? Now, that's what it isn't, but what is it? Well, what is financial freedom? I think first and foremost, financial freedom means peace. Remember, we've already hit on that somewhat. Remember, 1 Corinthians 14, 33 says that, that God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace. Financial freedom means peace. Remember, the peace that surpasses all understanding. Now, does this mean that, that when you begin to enjoy financial freedom that you're never going to have a material uh, financial hiccup or worse? Uh-uh. That is not what that means. That is not what God is saying. He does not promise you a life free of financial difficulties when you, difficulties when you choose to consider wealth and stewardship the way He wants you to. That's not what He's saying. As a matter of fact, Psalm 9.9 says, the, earth, the Lord is the refuge for the oppressed. A stronghold, listen, a stronghold in times of trouble. See, the Bible says, my friend, that you are going to be oppressed. You are going to have times of trouble. Even Jesus Christ said that in this world you will have trouble. Of course, he goes on to add, but take heart because I've overcome the world. See, even Jesus says you, you're going to have times of trouble. And do you know what I found along the way personally, experientially, as well as the people that come in for coaching and helping, you're going to fail. You're going to walk right out of here in our time together, and you're going to go right outside, and you're going to do and, and try and be all the things that the Holy Spirit would cause you to do and be, and you're going to slip, trip, stumble, and fall. But when you do, what you need to do is to remember that you are in pretty good company. Because you know what? As far as I can see, there's only been one person who ever walked the face of this earth that never failed at anything, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As a matter of fact, you know, the disciples failed big time in the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't they? Remember, they failed big time. But what did Jesus do? Did he come back and, and, and beat them up about the head and shoulders? No, 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 no. He came back and said, come on, get on up and be about the next thing. See, wh when you fall, when you fail, you need to recognize and understand why, and then you need to prayerfully resolve not to let your failures hold you back from your life relationship and walking with Christ. All right? Remember, remember show him your hand again. Allow him to fill it again. Give it back over to him again and get on down the road again, okay? Nope. God does not promise you a life void of material difficulties. He does promise to walk through those difficulties and those tough times with you. 
All right? He's going to use, remember we've already seen, he's going to use the hard times to help you and also help others through you. All right? Okay. So what is, what is financial freedom? Again, I think we can come back to Proverbs 10, 22 here. Remember, it's the, it's the blessing of the Lord that brings wealth. He adds no trouble to it. Now, you know, you know what this verse means to me here in this context? It means that the things that, the things that God provides, the things that God provides, they don't come with large monthly payments or balloon notes. Sorry, they just don't do that. You know, when God provides, it's good, and you know it. Simply put then, I tell you what, financial freedom, here's a good equation for you. You have it in your syllabus under number four there. It says, you have financial freedom when you have God. You have a relationship with God. You have riches. Those are wealth according to his definition. And you have peace. That's financial freedom. That's financial freedom. So, that's what it is. <laughs> but how do we get it? How do we get there? Let's start to get a little bit more practical here. Now, I have to tell you that I hate to write down a, just a one, two, three step approach to, to achieve financial freedom because I'm telling you, you, you can get so tied up with planning that you can miss the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to go there. Remember, remember tapes and books and seminars, even seminars like this, they're great stuff. But listen, don't ever confuse information with divine revelation. Okay? So, most of you... You know what, as we go back and we take a look and we get ready to walk down this, I think you would probably agree that, that, that most, of, most of what you've done financially in the past, you probably initiated yourself and then asked God to bless it. That's probably the way most of us have worked, right? That's the way most of us are. That's what, I, I will tell you in my life, I can remember there have been many times, so many times when my head was too big and my God was too small. Well, I tell you, that's got to quit. That's got to stop. We can't have that anymore. Remember, we leave those kind of excuses at the door. Yes, you need to plan, but listen, God needs to be the focus of your planning. And as we go, go through this, this planning process here, I, I don't want you to get hung up on the order either because any one or more of these may take you just the rest of your, your time on this earth before the Lord to come to grips with, and you may be already working with any one or more of these. So, yes, they're important. I think the order makes intuitively good sense, but don't get hung up on the order, Okay. All right, let's take a look. God's path to financial freedom. No surprise, step one. First step on, along the path to financial freedom is to get into and study God's Word. Now, I want to give you a caution here. Remember, you do not get to know God through a method or a plan. You get to know God through a relationship with a person, His Son, Jesus Christ. How, you know, how do you develop the relationship? You, get to, you, you, you spend time together in God's Word. Listen, you put on the belt. You get involved with the logo, the Word of Truth, the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. That's, that's how you start. And by the way, may, make no mistake along this first step here, this first step to, to God's path to financial freedom, getting into His Word, it is, not, it is not working for your salvation. It is what Paul calls working out your salvation. Okay, let's don't get confused there. Listen, aren't you, aren't you glad that, you know, there's a difference between the discipling process and, and the salvation process. I mean, ask, believe, and receive, and you're saved. But listen, I'm telling you, being a disciple takes work. It takes effort. It takes time. And there's no shortcuts. And it's the first step along God's path to financial freedom. Step number one, study God's Word. Now, step number two. At some time, at some point in time, you're going to have to come to the point where you have figured out what it is that you need to do to transfer everything that you have back into the ownership back over to God. Remember what we said? God said, would you give me your hand and what's in it? Well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? So it sticks and forms an impression and you can remember. Well, I tell you a couple of ways that come to mind. Number one, it doesn't have to be hard. For example, why not just take a three by five card and write on that three by five card, dear God, today I deed over to you everything in my possession and you date it and you sign it and then you put it where you put those kinds of things, right? You put it in your Bible, on the mirror, you know, in your car dash, wherever you put those kinds of things. But listen, if you, if you choose to, to, do the, to do that, be very careful because the very next morning, God just may bring some circumstances into your life to test and see if you really meant it, if you have any strings attached to it, okay? But I'll tell you, there's a way that my family, that my family does this second step. Um, we, spent, we spent quite a few years together in the military, and every... Every, every time that we, we moved someplace else and we got unpacked or approximately unpacked when the boxes were approximately in the right room, what we would do is that Debbie and my wife and, and my two children at the time, my, my, my son Brooks and my daughter Brianne, um, what we would do 
is that we would walk around through the whole house and we would pray over each room. And, and as we were praying over that room, we would also turn everything into that room back over to the ownership of God. Um, and, and we'd start with the living room. Now, I tell you what, we spent you know, a lot of years in the military, so we've been a lot of places, met a lot of people, and our house is very eclectic. I mean, it, <laughs> um, we have a lot of things that remind us of the people and the places and the things. And so I, I would pray over the living room, and I would, play, I would pray something like, you know, Lord, um, uh, thank you for bringing us to this place. And, and I'd go around the living room, and I'd say, thank you for that person and the chance to be at that place. And, and then, I, I, you know, I would turn everything in, in the living room back over to the ownership of God. I would say, Lord, this is, this is your furniture. And, and by the way, thank you, Lord, for giving us the funds to recover the couch. It looks just great, just exactly what we want. Thank you very much. It's yours. And, um, oh, yeah, and by the way, Lord, you know the TV over here? The TV is yours. And by the way, Lord, you know, I just pray that everything that ever comes into this house over your television is glorifying to you. See what I'm saying? We go around that. We're, we're, all, we're all standing at the door, but I'm praying over the living room. Now, then we go into the kitchen. And my, my wife, Debbie, is a wonderful, wonderful housemaker, homemaker, and she loves to cook. Now, we have a, we have a nice big kitchen. And on one side, there's a kitchen, then there's an island, and then there's an eat-in place. You know? So we would go into the kitchen, and, and Debbie would pray over the kitchen, and she would say, thank you, Lord, for the kitchen, and, and man, all these pots and pans and dishwashers, and the refrigerator is exactly what I wanted. Thank you very much. And, and she would go over and turn every bit of that back over to the Lord. And then she would say, Lord, and I just pray that every meal that's ever fixed here is healthy and safe, you know. And then she would say, you know, and Lord, every meal that's ever shared around this table, I, I, I pray that it would be peaceful, that it would be glorifying to you, that it would be a time of family focus and dedication. It wouldn't be a time of stress. And, and, and we'd spend some time doing that. And then we would do that from the very top to the very bottom of the house. We'd go to the top floor. We'd go down, took a little longer in the basement. Sometimes that's kind of convicting, isn't it? When you have to pray over something, you're not even sure what's in the box. It makes it kind of convicting. But we would do that. We'd, go, we'd do that in the garage. And then, you know what we would do? I think when our neighbors, our neighbors must have thought they, they were wondering who in the world moved in because I think they thought we are maybe a little crazy because then what we would do is that the four of us, we would walk out, hold hands, and we would walk around the perimeter of our lot. And we would claim that lot for Jesus Christ. And then we would come up, and I would stand up alongside the house, and I would put my hand on the house, and I would say, Lord, this is your house. It was yours before we got here. It is yours now. It's going to be yours when we leave. And Lord, I just pray that this house would be a lighthouse in the community. You see, that I know that, that the better than half of the marriage is in a divorce. So that means the person on either side of us, they're in deep trouble. So I would pray that, Lord, I just pray this would be a lighthouse in this community, that people, when they come here, they would feel the comfort and the presence of your Holy Spirit. And see, what we do now, what we do now, we don't move around so much anymore. So what we've done is to make it a habit. It becomes a family tradition every January 1st. On our, January 1st, as we celebrate the new year, that's just part of what we do. We have a special meal. Debbie fixes a traditional meal. And then, and then if it's just me, if it's me and... Uh, and the kids, if it's Debbie and me, and the, whatever, whoever's at home on January 1st, that's when it gets done. Now, what I suggest is that you figure out something you do with your family, something that you can do, re regularly do, routinely do, that it makes an impression here so that you can remember that, listen, God says, would you give it back? And you've got to figure out a way to do that. You've got to figure out a way to do that so that it sticks and you remember, you refresh your mind that, listen, truly, it's not just the word I say, but it is what I do. And so come up with a physical activity that you can do that. Second step along God's path to financial freedom is transfer ownership of everything in your hand back over to God. It may not be a simple process. It may take, uh, take some time to come up with the right process, but it's something that you need to do. Now, the third step is to pray. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So listen, if you want to be able to accurately understand the leading of God, then you need to begin to know what it's like to pray. By the way, that is exactly how Jesus Christ operated, wasn't it? I mean, the Bible says that Jesus would spend many a night all night praying. The Bible says that there were many times he would get up before dawn and be praying. And I believe that the disciples began to see that. I think that the, the, the disciples began to link the power that Jesus Christ had, that they saw that he had. I think they began to link that with his lifestyle, and a significant part of his lifestyle was prayer. I think that is why the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. 
teach us to pray because they recognize the connection between prayer and power. Okay? Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Um, then, well, then, okay, we need to pray and bring our concerns to God. But then we need to give God time to provide, don't we? But see, our attitude so many times is more like, I want it now, I don't want to have to wait. And for the most part, that's why we use credit, right? We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait. You know, i got I got to tell you that sometimes people say, you know, Bob, it sure sounds like you are negative on borrowing, you are negative on credit. And I have to say, my friend, I am really sorry. I guess that's because I'm negative on borrowing and I'm negative on credit. All right? But remember, money has no spirituality, neither does debt. It is how it is used and the attitude behind it. That's what is either glorifying or not glorifying to God. But then we need to pray. We need to bring our concerns to God. But then we need to give God time to provide. See, but our, our, again, our current attitude is we want it. We don't want to wait. We use credit. Listen, look at 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. We need, to, we need to learn how to wait. He's looking to us to make sure that we are committed to Him. And that means we don't get out ahead of Him. Listen, the disciples had to learn that the hard way, didn't, didn't they? Consider this. Now, this might be a reach, <laughs> okay? This might be a reach, but consider this. When Jesus Christ was about to leave the earth, He told His disciples to do what? He said, wait. He said, stay in Jerusalem and tarry and wait. Wait, because he was going to bring them the Holy Spirit. But what did they do? Did they go and wait? Ah, well, you know Peter. Good old impulsive Peter. What did Peter do? He said, listen, guys, before the Lord gave him the Holy Spirit, he said, listen, guys, I think what we need to do is to replace Judas. And you see, what happened was, what happened was they didn't have the Holy Spirit, so they had no communication with Jesus. So what did they do? They cast lots, and the lot came up to Matthias. Now, was this a good choice? Was it a bad choice? Was it a neutral choice? I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. But I do know two things for sure. Listen. Listen. First of all, I do know that what we find is after the disciples chose Matthias, before they were given the Holy Spirit, is that we never hear of Matthias again anywhere in God's Word. Never again. He never shows up again. Never shows up again. What do I also know? What I also know is that after the giving of the Holy Spirit to the disciples, they received specific instructions from the Holy Spirit time after time after time that we do read about, that we do hear about. You know, so what do we learn from this? Listen, when God says wait, He means wait. Yep, we can go ahead and, you know, I wonder how many times we, we get okay when we could have had God's best if we had just waited, if we had just waited. So again, we need to learn how to wait. Listen, if we're close enough to the Holy Spirit, to God, He's going to tell us when it's time to act, if we're listening. Okay, and when we pray, we need to pray according to His will, don't we? We need to pray according to His will. But how do you know the will of God? You think it, how many of you guys think it's possible to know the will of God? Think it's possible to know, to know the will of God? How many? Yes? You raise? Yeah. No? No? All right. Well, listen, I, I'll tell you what. I think, we can, I think we can know better than we do, and I think the way we can know better than we do is to ask. I think we can ask. But we have to be careful of the question that we ask. For example, there were years and years and years. I, I, I prayed, and I think it was a good question. I said, Lord, would you please show me your will for my life? I'm, you guys ever prayed for that way? You know, please show me your will for my life. Now, I think that was a great question. But you know what? Later on, God showed me maybe there was a better question than that. So now, I don't pray, God, show me your will for my life. I say, God, would you please show me your will? See the difference? His will and His will for my life. See, when I pray for His will and He shows me where He's working, that's Him showing me His will. That's His invitation for me to come along. And then guess what? His will becomes His will for my life. Just a different approach. Maybe it's a better question than it is for me. Because when I was praying, God, would you please show me your will for my life? Where was the emphasis? My life. When I pray, God, what is your will? Where's the emphasis? His will. His will. So yeah, I think we can do a better job. And I think, we have to, I think we have to ask the question. You know, what I believe from God's Word is that He will not often show us what He is going to do, but He does promise to always show us who He is. And when He shows us who He is, that's really all we need to know is to figure out what His will is and His will for our life. Okay? One last thing. 
I don't believe we're ever going to know God's will until we decide ahead of time that whatever it is, it's okay with us. All right? So, step number three, we, we need to pray. But then step number four, we need to have a right balance in our life. Now, what we've given you here in your syllabus is a, a spiritual sequence of priorities that we would like you to consider. All right? Now, right off the top, of course, is God. First priority is God. Luke 12, 31, but seek His kingdom and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, now again, this means that we need to be devoted to a person, not a cause. Listen. You know, the, somebody once said, and I think this is so good, that the key to being able to delight in the things of God is to first be able to delight in God Himself. Does that make, is that, that's a good word. That's a good word. Now, I know this, this step number one in my list of priorities is important, but I will tell you, even though that I know that it's important, I have a hard time with it. Now, maybe you are a lot like I am. I, I, I will tell you that that there was a point in time in my life as a brand new Christian, I had no trouble remembering to bring God along when I was in trouble. You know what I'm saying? I got into trouble. I got over my heart, my head. God, I, I'm right there. But then, a, but then a little bit after that, it, it occurred to me that, hmm, you know what? God probably wants to be along and enjoy the good times as well. So then I remembered to always be in touch with God during the hard times, and I'd always give Him praises during the good times. But you know what? I later discovered. The good times are here, and the hard times are here, but most of the time operating in here. I'm in the in-between time, right? And you know what was happening? I was leaving him out of the in-between time, which was most of the time in my life. So I'm a work in pro process just like you guys. So now I am really working with the Holy Spirit to try and get, get me to remember to, to bring and be part of the life of, of, of the Lord during the good times, the hard times, and in the in-between times. And the in-between times. He needs to be a priority. But though, and those of us who are married, then our spouses need to be our next priority. For, for example, Ephesians 5.22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And then Ephesians 5.25, we find that husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, these two verses form the basis of a lot of marriage encounter weekends, and, and this isn't one of them. But I think that you can see that it's clear that a couple, any couple, has got to learn to appreciate the strengths and weaknesses of each other to be good partners, to be good parents, to be good stewards. And by the way, notice these verses. Did, did you? Have, I, to me, the second verse holds a whole lot more burden than does the first. I mean, notice that it is the husband who is instructed to love his wife and not the other way around. Did you notice that? She's not told to love him, probably just because the Lord, having just made wives, knew that men, if we love our wives as Jesus Christ loves the church, I'm never going to have to worry about whether or not my wife loves me. You know what I'm saying? That's a good word. By the way, have you ever noticed that there's differences? Those of you guys that are, that are married, you ever noticed there are some differences in your life? Some of you are different. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed that? Now, this is not only true. It's true for a good reason. Larry Burkett used to say that if, you, if God put two identical people together, one of you wouldn't be needed, Right? See, I don't know what it's like in your family, but I'll tell you what it's like in my family. One of us likes to get up early. One of us likes, likes to sleep in. One of us likes to go to bed earlier than the other one. One of us is going around always messing up. The other one always having to clean up. You know, if my wife were here, she'd say, guess which one is which? You know, all right. I, in our family, I'm telling you, one of us could always get from point A to point B. The other one couldn't find their way out of a paper sack. You know what I'm saying? See, there are differences. There are differences. We have differences, and somehow we need to begin to work those out. Let me, let me give you an example. Again, in my life, I just share this with you because maybe it kind of hits home with you guys as well. You see, God has wired me to solve problems in a different way than he has wired my wife. Now, the trouble is our, our ways of solving problems sometimes tend to conflict, and we end up having an argument. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. We don't have an argument. Christian families aren't supposed to have arguments. We have a time of intensive fellowship, Okay. So we have a time of intensive fellowship sometimes because my way of solving a problem is I see the issue and I say, okay, now I'll go downstairs and I'll write out a problem statement, about 15 or 20 things that I think that can be done about it. I'll take the top four or five, I'll prioritize them, decide on one or two, and then I'll come up to Debbie and I'll say, Debbie, here's a problem, here's what I think we need to do about it. Now also being the super sensitive giant that I am around the house, I will always make sure and catch Debbie at just the right time, you know, when she's disciplining, disciplining the children or cooking a meal or, you know, doing, you know, talking on the phone or something like that. But anyway, and it drives her crazy because she doesn't like that approach at all, 
Not at all. See, she's wired a little differently. Um, when I travel around doing seminars and that kind of stuff, um, it used to be when the kids were at home, I, I, I would come back in and uh, on a Saturday or maybe a Sunday, if I drove back, it'd be a Friday night, a Saturday night, maybe if I had to fly, it was a Sunday. And I would come back in and I'm excited to see everybody. You know, hey guys, daddy's home, you know, yay, daddy's home, you know. And I'd walk in the house with a big smile on my face. Now, right away, being also the perceptive giant that I am, I would begin to sense that maybe everything didn't go quite well that weekend. Because, you know, first thing I see is the dog getting out of the way. Whew, tail between its legs, making it over to the corner, you know. The kids are over in the corner cowering, you know. The cat is nowhere in sight. And I see Debbie, and I say, hey, sweetheart, how's it going? How was your weekend? And she goes, fine. Ooh, fine. I say, ooh, man, I know what fine means now. See, fine means we're not talking about it right now. If you really want to know, we'll talk about it later after the kids go to bed. Okay? So what happens? The kids go to bed, and I sit down, and I say, okay, Debbie, I, I say, uh, tell me what happened this week, and how, how did it go? She said, well, do you really want to know? And of course, I don't say it. I'm smarter than that. But I, I feel like saying, you know, if I didn't want to know, I wouldn't ask. You know? So yes, I would like to know that. Please tell me what's going on. And she said, okay, I'll tell you. So I turn and I go over to sit down at the table in the kitchen because I figure we're going to have a conversation. I get over there and sit down. I look, at, I look around and Debbie's nowhere in sight. See, she's on the other side of the kitchen. She's fixing a cup of coffee, cutting up some fruit, maybe getting some cheese and crackers. See, And, and she comes over to the table and, and she sits down. She puts a couple of goodies in front of me and a couple of goodies in front of her. And she sits down and she goes, oh, my. And I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, you know, Saturday started out to be so great. It was, I was out walking the dog, and it turned into a praise walk. Man, I mean, we were just, I, it was just so great. It was so nice and cool out. And, and, and uh, you know, we've, we've got some new neighbors down the street. You know, they moved in. Looks like a young couple. Maybe you have a couple of kids that's our age. Oh, but anyway, I, I just went, we just kept walking around the neighborhood, and I was praising. And, you know, there's a garage sale down over, you know, and I'm thinking, I can give you about five minutes to this. You know what I'm saying? But that's not how she likes to do it. See, she likes to mm, tell the story, you know. She likes to mm, feel it, you know what I'm saying. And it used to drive me crazy. I'm smarter than that anymore. I just kind of grit my teeth and sit down and we talk about it, all right. But do you see what I mean? We are wired differently. We are wired differently. But one thing that I have come to know that, that, that God has given me the best counselor possible, only second only to the power of the Holy Spirit in the person of my wife. And wives need to recognize that God has given you the best counselor possible only to the second only to the Holy Spirit in your husband, in your husband. So, yes, we, we are beginning in our family to recognize that there are some differences. And this means we can only recognize that there are differences when we put our spouse as a priority. If the spouse isn't the priority, those differences won't make any difference. Is that not right? Okay. So, yes, spouse is a priority. But so are our children, for those of us who have children, whether they're home or not. Ephesians 6.4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. See, we, we, we need to work with our children. And when we begin to work with our children, we need to remember, we are not raising children. We are, we are raising future adults. And this means that we need, to, we need to learn how to deal with their individual personalities. Listen, that means that we need to invest time to get close to these kids and figure out how they're wired. Because listen, what works with one child may not work necessarily well with another child. As a matter of fact, the literal transition, translation of this verse tells us that we are not to mold our children into the little bitty people that we wish that we would have been or could have been or should have been. The literal translation, translation paints the picture of unfolding our children into the little bitty people that God wants them to be. This means that we need to invest time to figure out what that is. And that means, again, what may work for one may not work for others. But, you know, and by the way, I, I think we need, to be, we need to be careful about how we presuppose on our children what we want their lives to be like. For example... I don't believe every child in this country needs a college education. I, I believe that we have flat over educated a great number of the children in our society much more than they need or the society needs. But that's just kind of the attitude. Every child's got to have a college education. Well, hold on to that for a second because you know what I think, I, I know the statistics. The statistics say that 80% of the high school graduates don't know, they don't have a clue what they're going to do with the rest of their life. And what's the solution? 
Well, if their mom or dad can afford it, if they can get the loans to go do it, they go to a four-year college, right? And they, and, they get, and, they, and they get a degree because that's where the college is. That's where the, the sports are, the boys are, the girls are, the parties are, and all of that. But listen, the statistics don't change. Eighty percent of college graduates change careers seven times in a lifetime. They don't have a clue what they're going to do with the rest of their life. Change seven times in a lifetime. They first try and find money, the company cars, the office with the window, and then only if they're blessed later on do they find that thing that, they, that really gives them the peace. You know, yep, we're okay. Um, there's a story of the, of the doctor, and the doctor was at the, at the office working one day, and, and uh, he got a phone call from his wife, and his wife said, well, sweetheart, I think you need to come home. And the doctor said, man, I can't come home. I, I, you know, I've got a, I have an office full of patients. There is no way that I can come home. And she said, I think you better come home. He said, well, what's happening? She said, you know that new carpet that we got last week? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's wet and getting wetter. Well, what do you mean? Well, she said, well, the upstairs toilet is just, and this, the bathroom stool is just kind of running over down the hall, down the stairs, and it's just getting sopped and wet. I think you better come home. And the doctor said, okay, I'll come right home. So he came home and slopped through the, the carpet up the stairs, down the hall, and into the bathroom. And he, he looked at the, at, at the stool, and he couldn't figure out what to do. And so what he did was he went over to the phone and picked up the phone and called a plumber, and the plumber said he's going to come right over. Now, right away, you know this isn't a true story, right? Um, any plumbers here? No plumbers? Okay, all right. Anyway, the plumber comes right over. He goes upstairs. He sees what the problem is, and he puts his bag down on the counter, and he, he first of all reaches behind the stool and makes a couple adjustments, and the water quit, quits running. And then he reaches into his bag, and he gets this, pulls out this little tool that's kind of like a claw kind of kind of thing, you know, and he reaches down into the stool with that, and he comes back out with this little rubber, you know, children's toy, and he puts the, the toy down on the counter, puts the tool back in the bag, and he goes over and writes out a bill for $250 and gives it to the doctor. And the doctor said, my goodness, man. He said, I'm a doctor, and I, get, I don't get $250 for three minutes' work. And the plumber said, I didn't either when I was a doctor. <laughs> fictitious. True story. No, no, it's not. Totally fictitious. But I'll, I'll tell you that my experience has shown me that, a, listen carefully here, that a college education is not a prerequisite to make God our top priority, okay? I will tell you, when God is our top priority, He will let us know whether or not we or our children need a college education. Make sense? Okay, all right. Well, fourth is work. Fourth priority is work, Psalm 122, 127, 2. In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for He grants sleep to those He loves. There's another translation that says God blesses those he loves even while they sleep. See, this has got to be one of the most abused priorities we have. I'm sure you probably know a whole lot of people who are way out of balance on this. Their whole life is centered around their job to the expense of their relationship with their children, with their, with their church, with their, with their wife, with anything else important in their life. But we have to be careful here. We need to keep in balance. See, we need to turn our work over to God, and when we do, we need to be able to keep our work from consuming an inappropriate or disproportionate share of our resources, primarily our time, our time. Remember, it's balance that God wants in our life. Now, here at the bottom of the list is ministry. You see, when you ask Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, the Lord is going to give you spiritual gifts. Everybody gets at least one, and they may change over time. They may change over time. Now, as you spend time with Him, you're likely going to discover that somewhere along the line, those spiritual gifts could turn into a ministry, turn into a ministry. But let me suggest something to you, and let me see if you would agree. Would you agree that we have to be most careful for anything that competes for our loyalty to the person of Jesus Christ? Would you agree with that? Okay. Now, do you realize that one of the biggest competitors for our loyalty to Jesus Christ is our service for Him? Is that not right? I think you may know some lay people. You may even know some pastors who are out of balance in this, in this area. Man, they're, every day, first time when that door's unlocked, they're there. And when it's locked up, they're there to lock it up. And they, they, they operate the ministry at the expense of their family and friends. And it, it can be pretty ugly. But even a ministry needs to be kept in balance. Listen, ministry is a normal, natural result of a life that has Jesus Christ at the center. At the center. 
But we need to be so, so very, very, very careful because sometimes we get, so, we get so busy for working for the kingdom that we forget to have a relationship with the king. Look at Mary and Martha. Remember that story? Listen, Mary had a stronger desire to listen and to be taught and to sit at Jesus' feet rather than serve him. And guess what? Jesus said what? Good choice. Good choice. See, we are to serve, but never at the cost of our relationship. I, I, I look at it this way. When Jesus Christ is the center, I look at it like a wheel. A wheel. And Jesus Christ is the spoke. He's the center. And out from the spoke, I mean out from the hub, I have all kinds of spokes. I've got family, I've got children, I've got ministry and sports and church and Bible studies and all of the rest. Now our job as a family, to, to keep this wheel moving smoothly, that means all these spokes have got to be relatively the same length, right? Or if not, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Well, a bumpy ride isn't what God wants. We try and keep it in balance by making sure that the spokes are all relatively the same length. Let me show you what I mean. Um, there was a time a couple of years ago when I had a chance to, to go do some ministering in, in Hawaii. And it was in the middle of the winter, too. It was great. I'm sorry, somebody's got to do that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? But it was great. It was great. I had the chance to go over there for about a little over three weeks and, and do seminars and radio and a bunch of other stuff. And it was it was really great time for ministry. Um, but 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 you women who have a husband who leave for three weeks, you know what happened. Immediately one of the kids gets sick, the car quits, and the refrigerator goes out. You know. Well, so I, what happened, I get over to Hawaii the first day I show up. And, and uh, as is my custom, whenever I get someplace, I call my wife and say, I got here okay. And so I said, I got here okay. And she said, fine. <laughs> so right away I figured this is going to be an expensive, long phone call, right? And I said, okay, what's the matter? And sure enough, sure enough, Rianne ended up with the chicken pox. She was having car trouble, and the refrigerator went out. Now, she's a nurse, so she dealt with the chicken pox, but she still had the car and the refrigerator and, Brook and Brooks to tend, tend with. And so we went on for about 15, 20 minutes talking about all the things that she had. And she did everything perfectly. She really did. It really, really turned out, she did a great job, but it was stressful for her. And so she communicated that. And we were talking on the phone, and, and then she said, okay, that's enough about me. Now, what about you? She said, uh, you got there? Okay, that's great. Now, um, did you find a place to live while you're there? And I said, yes. I said, yes, I, I've, got a, I, I've got a condo about 45 minutes from the beach. What? Uh, I have a condo about 45 feet from the beach. What? 45 feet from the beach, the kids, the car, the refrigerator? And I said, no, wait a minute. Being a retired military person, the cheapest place I could get was an Army Recreation Center. Condo, 45 feet from the beach, $35 a night. All right? That was as good as it. Okay, all right, I'll, get, I, I'll give you that, she says. And she said, well... I know you're going to be going around to a lot of, are you taking public transportation? Are they going to come and get you? And I'm like, oh, man. She said, did you rent a car? What did you do? And I said, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I rented a car. Oh, yeah, you rented a car? Yeah, I rented a car. She said, okay, what kind of car did you get? I go, oh, man, I got a little red convertible. Say what? I got a little red convertible. What? 45 feet from the beach, convertible, Hawaii, the kids, the car, the, you know. And listen, I told her, I said, it's a little red geo convertible. I said, it wasn't any longer than this table. And I will tell you after the conversation, I was so convicted I didn't put the top down the whole rest of the time I was there. Wait a minute. Do you believe that? No, 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 absolutely not. Absolutely not. But listen, the point is this. It was a great time in ministry. It really was. But it was a hard time for our family. But what made it work is that my wife and I, we prayerfully decided beforehand that those kinds of times would be the exception and not the rule. See, what happens is most of the time without planning, it becomes the rule and not the exception. So you've got to learn how to work those kinds of things in there. Yeah, everything has got to be kept in balance. That's what the Lord wants. That's what the Lord wants. And that's step four. Well, let's move on down. Step five, you need to have a clear conscience. You know, Jesus teaches that, that there are conflicts within the body of Christ that are going to come up. And he, sh he shows us how to resolve them in accordance with Matthew 18, 15, and 5, 24. But it, but it may not be a pleasant process because a lot of times when we have to resolve conflicts, there's some pride involved. See, but in the Proverbs, we're told to own up to our own shortcomings. We're told to confess our sins. This, this means that we need to have a spirit of humility. I, I, I'll tell you, basically, step number five, I think, is best summed up very nicely by a, a verse that you don't have in your, in your syllabus, which is Acts 24, 16. Acts 24, 16 says, 
I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Do you want to begin to know what it's like to begin to enjoy financial freedom God's way? Well, then you need to be able to act in such a way as to keep your conscience clear before God and man. Step number six, avoid indulgences. We've talked a little bit about this. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And in John 6, 27, Jesus instructs us not to work for the food that spoils, but for the food that endures. Listen, remember that an indulgence is something that has very little, if any, utility. See, you need to identify the indulgences, and then like we talked about later, you need to be able to control them. And then finally, step seven here along God's path to financial freedom is to learn to accept God's provision. Look, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and Philippians 4, 19 both speak to the fact that God will provide for us. He will not forsake us. The question is, do we trust Him or do we just say that we trust Him? See, it's easy to say that I trust you, God, but it's something else if you're having to sit here today not knowing how you're going to feed and house and clothe your your family, or whether you've got money to pay for next semester's tuition or the rent for next week. You, you, listen, unless you've ever had to trust God, you may not know what it's like to trust Him. Okay, so here you, what you have is a seven-step process to find God's path to financial freedom. And let me give you a couple of personal opinions here. Um, I, I, I think you, what you need to do is to begin to think of financial freedom as a process, not as a destination. You, you see, I, I think financial freedom is much more a journey than it is a destination. So what you need to do is to consider these as tools as to help you manage the journey, okay? Okay, now, now that you know what financial freedom is, remember, it's the absence of financial bondage. Well, now let's begin to put together a plan of action, a written plan of action that's going to help you prepare to get started on the path, all right? A written plan of action. Why, why a written plan of action? Because I will tell you over 25 years it's been my experience in my life and the lives of others that to have no written plan is the same thing as having no plan. Same thing as having no plan. And not to plan according to God's word is slothful. Now on the other hand, having a written plan also helps keep me, keep me from being legalistic. So I think having a written plan makes me somewhere in between being, being slothful and re realistic. That's how it works. Okay? That's, what, that's why you need to do it, but what goes in it? Well, what I suggest is that you consider putting in there your needs, your wants, and desires. Now, what are needs, wants, and desires? Well, the needs are the basic material necessities of life. It is the minimum that you would have to spend to be able to live and to eat and to clothe and all the rest. Now, wants moves it up a notch. It covers the same basic requirement, say for transportation, but at a higher quality or quantity. And a desire, well, a desire is something that, again, satisfies the same basic requirement, but is something that you might use if money were absolutely no object, no, no object at all, okay? For, for example, I, I think that in our society today, most of us would recognize that we have a requirement for transportation. Now, for most of us, most of the time, the requirement for transportation can best be met by a car, by a car. So, a car, having a car that meets me my, my transportation needs at the need level, the requirements at the need level might be a 1987 um, uh, Volkswagen Bug blue paint toward upholstery, you know, uh, runs pretty well, gets from point A to B, costs maybe what, six, seven, eight hundred dollars? Okay? Now, f now, to meet the requirement for transportation at the needs level, it might be a, a 2001, 2, 3, or 4 Chevrolet Caprice four-door air conditioning, runs a little bit nicer, cruise control, that kind of thing. Maybe, what, three, four, five thousand dollars 5000 Now, I'm telling you, if money was no object, I, I think transfer, you know, transportation requirement, well, at the, at, at, at the blessings level up here, at, at the desires level might just be a 2011 Mercedes two, you know, four-door, a little sports roadster convertible, $150,000 point of entry. See what I'm saying? You, you, you know, that's the, the idea is that you need to realize that you have needs and wants and desires. And you need to figure out where you are at each level of the budgeting process. Are you operating at the needs level, at the wants level, and at the desires level? You need to figure out where you are, pray about where you believe what God would have you to be, and then you move in that direction. It makes decisions a whole lot easier when you compare needs, wants, and desires. Especially... What happens when you get into a situation where you may have some cash flow issues? 
and, and, and you need to cut back a little bit, it makes intuitively good sense that if, that if you can now know every step of the way on all of your budgeting items, what are the needs and the wants and the desires, and you get into a, a problem, you can cut back from the desires to the needs and from the needs, I mean from the desires to the wants and from the wants to the needs. But most of the time what happens, we get to the easiest ones and we say, well, we're just going to cut out the needs. I want to keep the wants and desires, thank you very much. We're going to cut out all entertainment and recreation. Wrong. Wrong. You, you need to back down a little bit. So you, it will help you learn how to cut back. Uh, some other items, and just suggest, we're going to cover a lot more about this in the next phase, but, but you can learn how to do some of the things around your home and your car yourself. Um, you can learn how to substitute lower depreciation items for higher ones. For example, if your washing machine goes out, listen, if you go to Sears and you buy the, the, the prettiest, biggest one with, with all the whistles and buzzes and, and, and bells on it, you're going to pay top dollar. But if you need a washing machine and your funds are limited, why not go to a used appliance place, buy one that's stripped down, very basic, and avocado green? You know what I'm saying? Cost you a whole lot less. Cost you a whole lot less. Learn how to conserve. Listen, there are a lot of things that you can learn to do to cut back, but it's easy to cut back when you un understand your needs, your wants, and your desires. A couple of other things that you can consider doing. Think before you buy. For example, here, try going on a cash-only basis for a while. Listen, you want to know who really is the Lord of your life? Try and go on a cash-only basis for two or three months. That's going to tell you who you're dependent upon. Or decide. Is it a necessity or is it an indulgence? I mean, is there a need in your life that just can't get met any other way? What about this one? Does it reflect your Christian ethics? I mean, what kind of TV and magazines and, and, and Internet sites do you, come in, do you have coming into your house? Do you even know? Do you even know? Is it the very best possible buy you can bet, get? Can you, can you check consumer reports? Have you checked around for best prices? Have you shopped and compared? Again, is it highly depreciative? You know, buy something without the bells and the buzzers. Does it require costly upkeep? I can remember coming back from my military assignment in Germany. was tra transferred out to California along with a bunch of the other guys. And, and a lot of the guys couldn't wait to get to California to buy a house with a swimming pool. But I'm telling you, within six months, many of them would just love to bulldoze that thing in if they could because it costs so much to upkeep. You've got to think about it. It's just more than just buying what it is. You've got to figure out what it costs to maintain it. Or what about can you rent it or you, can you borrow it? Oh, man, I remember when we, were li when we were stationed in Germany, we rented a house from a German couple, and there was one lot, and there were two houses, and they lived in one, and we lived in the other. And we were, we were having a, a, a barbecue on a weekend one weekend and out and having a good time together, as we often did. And, and Herr Beisch said, he said, well, Bobby said, I need you to watch over the place for me. We're going to be gone for about three weeks. I said, whoa, where are you guys going to go? And he said, well, we're going to go down and spend three weeks at, you know, at a cabin on one of the islands down on a lake in Switzerland. And I said, man, I didn't know you had a, that you owned a cabin down in Switzerland. And he said, now, why would I want to do that? And, and he could see, I, you, you know, and he said, listen, he said to me, true story, I don't know what it is about you Americans, but you don't feel that you can enjoy anything that you do not own. Does that hit home? Does that hit home? You know what, I think, now remember, God does not condemn the wealthy. He doesn't, he doesn't go there. But i got to believe there are many of us with motorhomes and boats and lake lots and all of the rest of the stuff. We could rent ten times better than what we use if we just rent instead of paying the money to buy it, to finance it, and to maintain it. You know what I'm saying? Can you rent it or can you borrow it? Finally, does it bring you closer to God? I am not a hunter or a fisherman, but I like to hunt and fish, and I know a lot of guys who are really hunters and fishermen, you know? But every guy that I've ever known that ever bought a bass boat always tried to convince me that bass always bite best when? Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Think before you buy. Does it bring you closer? Does it bring you closer to God? Think before you buy. Or what about this one? Number four, avoid leverage. Avoid le What's leverage? Leverage is having very little of your own resources tied up to buy anything that you buy. For example, houses or cars or investments. Now, now let me be quick to say that the use of leverage in and of itself, does not violate a single biblical um, principle that I can find, except for the fact that most often leverage leads to surety. What is surety? Surety, according to the Bible, is taking on an obligation without a clear way to repay. For example, you buy a house or car or an investment with very little down, 
and, and, and you just suppose that if you, if you get hung up and, and your cash flow gets hurting and, and you can't afford to make the payment, then, then you're either going to sell it and take your profit or you're just going to give it back to the bank and walk away. Well, listen, in today's market, that doesn't happen anymore. It used to be that kind of stuff could happen, but it doesn't, doesn't happen anymore. The way that it normally happens, if you've made a very little down payment, when it comes time to get rid of that house or that car or whatever, it's likely you can give it back to the bank, but they're going to be glad to take it back, but they're going to come back against you with what's called a deficiency adjustment. If you owe $100,000 on something and you give it back to them and they sell it for fifty, dollars you no longer are going to have that something and still owe the bank fifty. dollars It's called a deficiency judgment. Okay? Now, the problem is, you don't know, and that's surety. If you don't have the item and you're still pay for, paying for it, that's surety. You have taken on an obligation without a clear way to repay. Now, uh, let me say very carefully, though, that, that, if, that if your job happens to be, your career happens to be buying apartment buildings, and you find an apartment building that you can buy with very little, if anything, down, and you do, and it doesn't work out, and you sell it, and even if you take a loss, you lose your down payment, you lose some money on it, but, but if you sell the building and you're no longer paying for it, then you didn't have surety. Surety, the bad thing about surety is you don't realize you're there until you're there. You know what I'm saying? So, no, God doesn't say don't use leverage. The trouble is most leverage leads to surety, and God says don't ever get involved in surety. And I know this flies right in the face of OPM. What's OPM? Other people's money? Just be very careful here. Consider what God's Word says about surety and staying away from leverage. Another point to consider is, as you build, you and the Lord build your plan of action is to practice savings. See, you absolutely must develop the habit of practicing savings. But I'll tell you, doing it is not easy, especially if you're not doing it now. And if you're not doing it now, I know there are quite a few of you that are probably thinking something like, I can't save a lot, therefore it's meaningless, meaningless for me to say, save anything. But boy, once I start to get a little bit more, I'll start saving, right? Wrong, wrong. See, according to God's word, it's not meaningless to save small amounts because, like everything else, it's the habit and the attitude that leads to the habit that is far more important than the amount. And by the way, saving a little over a long period of time is a great way to accumulate wealth. See, the data shows, by the way, if you don't save when you're earning little, you're not going to save when you earn more. But on the other hand, there are some of those you know, who think God frowns on a Christian, on anybody who saves anything. You know, as a Christian, we're to give everything away. Now, he may call you to give everything away, but, 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 but watch your attitude here. Watch your attitude, because Proverbs 21.20 says this, There are stores of choice food and oil in the house of the wise, but the foolish man devours all that he has. See, I, I believe that God's Word teaches you, even encourages you to save. Therefore, it's something you need to add as part of your plan of action. So here we've given you some things to consider to come up with a written plan of action to help you get moving along the path to financial freedom. Now remember, financial freedom is where we want to go. We can only do that when we see all of the things that we see more of the things that God has up and operating than we see the things that God does not have up and operating, okay? And I'll tell you, this is a great, this is a great segue back over into our Roman soldier again here, okay? See, we've already talked about the belt of truth and the breastplate and the shoes of shoes of peace, now, now it's time for the shield of faith. I found out some fantastic stuff about the Roman soldier's shield. This is a pretty poor representation because you see that the Roman soldier actually had two shields. One was kind of like a frisbee. It was light, it was round, he used it in parades, and then he also used it in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's not the word that Paul chose to use here. The word that Paul chose to hear was the theoros, which is the Roman soldier battle shield. And in all actuality, this, this shield was not curved quite like this. It stood, it stood about four to five feet tall, and it was two to three feet wide. And it was made from five to six layers of animal skin. Okay, And it was tough as nails. It was absolutely tough, tough as nails. It was extremely long-lasting and hard-wearing. And why did, the, why did the Roman soldier need to have this kind of a, a shield? Well, have you ever seen of those old Roman movies and you see when the, when, the, when the Romans get attacked or when the Romans attack, you see the, the arrows going through the air and they're all lit up on fire? You know what I'm saying? Listen, I, I didn't know this, but you know what I discovered? 
that more people, that w w to get the arrows to light, they would soak them in tar. They would, they'd have tar and they'd light them and they'd shoot them. And the idea was, yeah, if somebody was stupid enough to stand out and get hit by the arrow, they'd get killed. That's right. But the soldiers were all hiding behind these guys, right? So the objective wasn't to hit and to kill, it was to nick. Just even to nick. Because if the tar got into the body, the body had an infection and they, more people died from the infections than they ever did dying from getting hit with the arrows. So he had to have a big shield to be able to keep himself protected from the flaming arrows or the fiery darts that Paul calls, right? Okay. Interesting, a couple of interesting things also that I discovered. The, the Roman soldier was a, was a very disciplined person. And he had a discipline. He was a creature of habit. And part of that discipline and habit included how he took care of his shield. Every day, every day, he would get up and anoint his shield, he would rub oil into this shield to keep all of those hides of leather from cracking and being brittle and breaking and falling apart when they were hit, okay? And then also, before he would go into battle, he would soak the shield in water so that when the flaming arrows of the enemy would hit his shield, they would be put out, they would be extinguished on, on contact. Interesting, because Paul says this is what? our shield of faith. You see some interesting parallels here? See, first and foremost, just, just and, and by the way, the Roman soldier, both of these shields, not like we see here, they were attached to the belt. Both shields were attached to the belt for easy mobility, okay? And just, just as the Roman soldier's shield was attached to the belt, first thing Paul says is our shield needs to be attached to what? Our belt of truth. Our belt of truth. Listen, Paul tells us that, 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 that what he is saying is that your, your faith needs to be attached to your logos, the written word of God. He's saying that the presence or absence of faith in your life is determined by the presence or absence of God's word in your life. The first, Paul, the first point that Paul makes is that your faith and the word of God must be absolutely inseparable. Okay? Now listen, also, just as a Roman battle shield you know, covered the soldier from head to foot, Paul is telling you that you meant God gives you enough faith to cover you to meet every need that is ever going to come up in your life. See, when you see the devil's attacks coming against you when, you, when you see the flaming arrows of maybe insults or financial setbacks and temptations, well, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your faith is strong enough and hard enough and enduring enough to protect you from all of that, okay? It's going to protect you. And, and, and just as this shield would be long-lasting, so your shield of faith needs to be extremely tough and exceptionally durable and long-lasting. Isn't it interesting how the Roman soldier took care of his shield? He rubbed it with oil every day. Same way. Your faith needs to be anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. And just like he would soak his shield in water, Paul is saying, he knew all of this. He is saying it is so critical for you to soak your shield of faith in the water of the Word, which is what it says in the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians. Why? Well, because Colossians 2.15 says that the devil, listen, the devil may not be your only or your main problem. Because if you are continually controlled by habitual hang-ups and struggles with the same, that you struggle with the same hassles and emotional upsets, listen, your, your primary problem may, may be you haven't made a decision to submit this area of, the Lord, of your life over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Okay? You, you, listen, my friends, if your shield of faith was properly anointed by the Holy Spirit and saturated with the Word of God, then I am telling you the devil's arrows wouldn't, they would be extinguished upon impact. Okay? So what do you do? You make certain on a daily basis, on a regular time, you spend a time in the Lord attached to your belt to where the Holy Spirit can anoint your life and your health and your finances and your family, and you keep it soaked in the water of the Word. You keep it soaked in the water. And, and one more interesting point here, how are we doing? I want, I want to cover this. Listen, something exciting that I found out about, on each side of the Roman shield were two clips, were two clips, and the clips were designed to link and to connect to the shield next door. 
And that way, when the Roman phalanx advanced, it was a solid wall of shields. And if something happened and one, slip, one person slipped and tripped and stumbled, the shield, the line of shields would, continually, would continue to go on, right? It would continue to link. Here's what I believe. Paul is telling us that individually, listen, individually, our faith can be a mighty defensive weapon. But listen, when linked to the faith of other like-minded believers, we become almost invincible. Almost invincible. And by the way, is the shield of faith important? What does Paul say? He says, above all, take the shield of faith. Above all. He says, listen, if you forget anything else, you better not leave home without your shield of faith. Okay? Let me ask you. Is your faith in the material areas of your life starting to crack and to buckle and to, and to wear out and break because you haven't kept it oiled and watered? Well, I'll tell you what. Then it's time to pick it up, clean it up, and link arms with an accountability partner, your pastor, your coach, so you do not have to go through this alone. Your spiritual and financial defensive posture is much stronger when you link with other people. Link with other people. Oh, okay. Well... Busy hour, a lot of material. We've, we've begun to see, though, God's plan, His path, and a written plan of action. We talked, about, we talked about the spiritual armor. Are you again beginning to see how all of this fits and ties together? God has given us all that we need so long as we employ what it is that He gives us. He gives us His Word. He gives us armor. He gives us everything that we need. But He expects us to get active and up and operating and involved in the process and in the plan. Again, out of the, out of the grandstands, into uniform, and into the game. And when we do, we trust Him as our coach. He has a game plan that's a winner, but we need to follow His direction using His resources. And that's what, that's what, we're all, that's what financial freedom, that's what financial freedom is all about. Now, we're going to take a break, but, but as we take a break, I want you to take just a couple of minutes. I'm going to look back over your notes and, and again, star, underline, do whatever you do to identify the single most important thing that the Holy Spirit gave you this last hour so you can come back and look at it, test it, share it, apply it, whatever it is that you need to do, okay? Let's take a break. Break, break. <laughs> 